1947, Graham joined the Nebraska Farmers Union. While at the Nebraska Farmers Union, he worked with, on, Nebraska, on climate change and renewable energy education issues and worked on agricultural and energy policy issues at both the state and federal level. Currently, Graham is the founder and president of GC Resolve, a communications and consulting company which focuses on grassroots community development, mobilization and education with an emphasis on environment and equality and the creation of more resilient communities. Current projects um, with that GC Resolve is doing, including educating and advocating for a change in the food production system to incorporate regenerative principles. Christensen also owns and operates a, the business GC Revolt, a solar and alternative energy company, and is the state secretary and director of Nebraska Farmers Union. He's also actively evol involved in operating Christensen Farms, Inc., and they're adopting regenerative principles in their farm. Graham, take it away. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Brittany, do you have the share screen, the host, co-host function shared so I can share some screen? Because I have a couple slides I'd love to share with everybody. You should be good to go. Thank you. Then I saw that there was someone that bounced into the presentation right as I was starting. So I'm gonna to go to participants really quick and make sure that these two are admitted. And I think we are good there. I'll try to keep an eye on that the best I can as well. Greetings, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you on this evening to talk about regenerative agriculture. Um, I was tasked with kind of framing uh, regenerative agriculture. So um, four starts. Let's see, there we go. Um, this is my background. Um, Ken, Ken summed it up. Um, that's a shot of me with my grandfather um, when I was just a, just a toddler um, farming. And just a, another historical picture from our farm. This, this picture is sometime in the early 1900s because this house burnt down in the Great Depression. So that guy, second from the right to the top, that's where my last name comes from. That's, that's Christian Christensen. And you'd be surprised with some of the pictures I see from the old days and how uh, much more biodiverse their farming ac operation actually was than what ours is in the modern day. Now you can't talk about the solutions unless you're also focused on what some of the issues are. And while there's been an uptick in commodity prices here just recently, um, you see seven years in the, in the red is no way to go about business. We're seeing increased nutrient loading in our waterways, um, both in well water and also um, with running waterways. And so through citizen scientist efforts that, that um, we've co-created uh, with the UNMC and the University of Nebraska Lincoln Department of Civil Engineering, um, we've been able to admit or actually um, partner with citizens from all across the eastern third of the state to start our, to have a better tab about of what our water quality looks like. And you can see the reds are over the legal limit of nitrates set by the EPA of 10 parts per million. And so we have, it's not we're bumping into water quality issues. We have a water quality issue. And what we're all gonna be talking about today and what Kiss the Ground is trying to highlight um, really provides uh, ways that we can improve this situation. And I think regenerative ag is the best way to go about it. This is a shot of excess nutrient leaching um, at Lanoma Beach, uh, which has had a long reputation in their history of, of dealing with these kind of issues. Um, the climate change issue is a part of this. More biodiversity through these systems is gonna allow for more carbon sequestration. And of course, we're starting to see the bigger things happen. This is my home community during the 2019 floods. Uh, this is this is our football field that I used to compete on, and this is in the Missouri River Valley, not too far away from me. So um, we're starting to see more and more issues, and and agriculture um, has the ability to stabilize some of the erosion that's lost during these, but also start pulling down emissions, so we don't have as volatile conditions. And you can see this young farmer near Fremont; he's got the right idea. He's starting to put rye rye grass in between, um, you know, and after he could, gets done with his harvest. So the solution is in the soil. Um, what is the solution from good agricultural practices? It's reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions. 
not just CO2, but also nitrous oxide. Um, and then there's more and more evidence that by implementing good grazing herds, um, much like what we would think about across the continent of Africa um, or the, um, the, the pre-industrialized days and, uh, and when the native people were the only people here, um, you could see uh, with the bison that, that there is more and more evidence that methane emissions can be reduced through these practices as well. So that's three greenhouse gases, not just CO2. But we have better water holding capacity, better water filtration for clean water, and we have the ability to grow more nutritious foods for an overall better health. The test case, I've been using this for a long time, but it's such a great example. And this guy has been out in front. He's out in front of us. He's out in front of many people. But uh, Delphi Fike went from 7,000 acres to 700 acres. And um, back in the, uh, right around 1990, um, at that time, he let the cattle out of the feedlot, pastured them, um, added more uh, different, um, he got kind of out of the monoculture rhythm. Uh, not only did he pasture some land, he added a lot of cover crop and small grains into the uh, rotation, was able to minimize his costs and without adding a drop of um, synthetic uh, nitrogen for over a decade, he saw his organic matters uh, levels raise from 2.6 to 6.9%. And we've seen um, more reports coming out of the USDA that just a slight increase in your organic matter levels um, can lead to as, as much as a $200 net um, per acre net savings. And so there's productivity goes up and so does the profitability. So what are the actual practices? And, you know, there are different stages towards regeneration and we, a lot of us have a long ways to go. And I think we have to like really respect that, that not everybody's going to be there right away, um, but we all need to be, uh, we all need to start heading in that direction with the overall goal of trying to make as much of these things work that fit in our respective ecosystems as possible. So minimize your tillage. If you can do no till with these systems, better. Um, addition of diverse cover crops, and then getting out of the monoculture and adding more crop rotations in. So it's not just corn or soybeans, you actually have other productivity. Um, these systems should be augmented by managed grazing. Um, so more animals out of confinement and into managed grazing systems. And then when you get good with that and you start seeing in soil um, on farm fertility, which means you're producing your own nutrients by utilizing more biodiverse systems with grazing, um, that's when you start really seeing the money come back into, into your bank account. And then furthermore, vertical farming is becoming more and more of the talk. So we're looking at intercropping trees for various purposes. I think this is a huge slide right here, regenerating our community opportunities as well. So we start with regeneration of the soil. Regenerating the soil and improving the quality of the soil is our number one prerogative. But we get all those things that I mentioned on the prior slide. But with that, when we start to focus on this and the health and quality of people, we start to redevelop infrastructure around the area that creates jobs and entrepreneurship opportunities for young people of all kinds to, to cohabitate in our state and be part of this climate solution, but also be an economic solution based. Composting, milling, trees, cover crop seeds, various livestock, bees and pollinators, processors of small types um, and mid middle size, food co-op coordination, there's marketing, there's local distribution system, there's increase in skills jobs to support these in their tech. And so all of these things start to make up the future of what Nebraska will be like when we adopt regeneration as a whole. Um, here's some pictures. These are regenerative farms. Um, got a couple more that I'll flash through really quick, but I wanted to take a quick synopsis on our farm because I think it's important to share with you all what we're doing. So Pretty much everything that we have full management control under, um, we put under cover crops last year. So 612 acres, we're using eight different species of diverse cover crops. Um, if you looked out the window down the hill now, this is the first year we've had a complete quarter section and visibility that, that is all green. And I'm so excited um, about that right now. We've gone all to non-GMO varieties in order to minimize our, our, some of the more harmful chemicals that were on our place. Um, and we've redesigned nutrient management plan, the chemical plan all within the last year. We planted a hundred plant, uh, plant hazelnut orchard that we are looking at expanding into alley cropping, which is new for the state of Nebraska. Um, but this is an experimental test plot in partnership with the Nebraska Forestry Service that is hoping to breed good hazelnuts that don't create, create rust issues, um, which can plague us here and allow us more diversified crop opportunities. 
And um, we've expanded wildlife habitat and we're looking better at nutrient um, uh, water management as well on our irrigation systems. So this is the bear quarter that you're looking at uh, from a snapshot right now. This is our farm. Um, this is one quarter section of our farm. And on this, on this snapshot, you can see there's not a lot of biodiversity. We have these old shelter belts that are starting to get beat up and wear down that our ancestors planted. But what we're looking at doing for a plan in the future is being able to expand into all kinds of different ventures on our farm using regenerative principles. So all those lacrosses, those are trees that we're actually looking at that would not be where the pivot goes around. You can kind of see those, those angle, those circular angle things. This is an irrigated field. There's a pivot circle that windshield wipes across and stops at the farm, then you turn it around and it goes to the other side. That non-irrigated area, um, we're highly considering adding great as grazing areas and those trees would serve as what's called silvopasture. It would create a habitat on the top of a hill that would help uh, give a better uh, area to sit those cattle and to graze through those cattle. Um, up here um, on the left side, you see P, that's a pond. That's gonna be cut off so it'll hold more water in, instead of letting it erode down here. And of course, you can see that erosion goalie that works its way down to the bottom of the hill where it's all wet and you see Bell Creek. We have a CPR program or a CRP program that expands those waterways and protects those as buffers, but we would expand that further as we're doing now into grazing area. Right now it's just wildlife habitat in the program, but those will become permanent pasture. In the corners, you can see they're cut off. There's G's, those, those are looking more like permanent pasture. And then we have the hazelnut orchard and also a spot for a greenhouse that will look to plant their years. The A's that go around in circles, those are gonna be where we put a um, alley cropping or agroforestry tree systems under our pivots. So we're looking for a smaller tree that doesn't disturb the circle of the pivot. And then those will also greatly cut off the erosion goalies as well as um, uh, be able to provide additional cropping opportunities and employment for one young person who has an appetite to implement agroforestry. And on the top, we have a row of cedars that we're gonna start using as border plants um, that we can use as well. Um, this last slide's Ken, because I know we're, we're, we're gonna be getting close to time here, I'm guessing pretty quick. Um, but that is the future plans. These are the areas that we're heading towards. And so we'd be looking in summary to add cows in a couple of years. We're already experimenting with trees and cover crops and then alley cropping systems as well as expanding the pastures. Um, the other thing I should say about this process is now we are doing cover crops, but we would like to plant them or drop them over corn earlier in the season, R4 to R6 corn, um, which that means it's before the 4th of July, essentially. And it should be able to root and come up and we harvest the corn and we have a rye crop there, then we can graze through it so we can maximize the same amount of land that we had in corn production, better use the fertilizer for the cows and, um, and uh, we should be able to save a lot of money and add a whole new market for, for another young farmer that's already agreed to come up and help manage our herd. But it's not just for Eastern Nebraska, it's for all parts of the state. And so when you get to drier, arid areas, you can use livestock to be able to really help the situation as well. Um, and so I think that's a really, really exciting opportunity for other parts. And if you can do it in Chihuahua, Mexico, you can definitely bring that kind of stuff up to the panhandle of Nebraska and into some of these sand hills areas. And there's a lot of good models and more biodiverse systems that are starting to percolate. Um, but the final slide that I really want to talk about is creating the vision that Ken was asking for. It's not a silver bullet. We have work to do, but I think we've identified the key areas that we need to address right here. And this is them. If we want to become a regenerative state, there are eight components that we need to be able to do. Number one is we need to buffer all waterways. We need to revamp LB 70, 729. We need to bring that back up in an upcoming legislative session and buffer our waterways. That bill can be tweaked. It needs to be brought up. There's an opportunity to do this. I've talked to some folks, especially what's going on in the lower Elkhorn NRD, and there is some interest. Let's get on that. We need to expand cover cropping onto all row crop areas. We need to explore how we can get more cattle or other livestock reintegrated into the majority of Nebraska farm and ranch land systems as grazing systems, not mega confinement systems. We need to be able to be able to transition that in a safe manner for those folks, but we have plenty of land sitting idle out here that really could use livestock on it. Our place is an example. We have degraded rangeland restoration. 
We have integration of silvopasture grazing rotational systems, and we need to we need to spruce up those statewide shelter belt programs before we start seeing more and more dust uh, flying around as well. Um, agroforestry needs to be revamped. We need marketplaces for that, and it can be um, and and that alley cropping I was talking about as part of it as part of it. And then I think um, uh, the close it more distributed alternative energy systems will help us become a much more efficient state um, as well. So, you know, we could dive into this stuff all day, but we have other great speakers and I'm just glad to be here with all of you and can't wait to hear your presentations as well. Well, thank you, Graham. That was some really exciting material. And, uh, and I presume that we can make your slides available to folks uh, uh, that, that we, you can send them to us and we can make them available to folks. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is all for everyone and I'm available most any time if you can catch me. Um, Sounds great. Well, me, I, I try to make time for everyone to talk through these things, but those slides are available, Ken. That sounds good. Um, well, and we do have, there was a question that was posted in the chat, but I, I what I'd like to do um, is to encourage folks to put questions in the chat but we'll ask them at the end um, and just to so that we, that we can get through all the presentations. And once again, uh, I'm seeing more and more friends on the and on the the uh, joining the call and it's really good to see everybody here. I'd like to uh, to move now to Andrea Beige uh, for her presentation. Andrea is an assistant professor in cropping systems at the University. University of Nebraska Lincoln's Department of Ag Agronomy and Horticultural Department. Her research focus is on the agronomic benefits and trade offs of diversified cropping systems, including perennial crops and cover crops. She also has experience researching the opportunities that improved soil health offers for managing water related risks, such as floods and droughts. In her role, she is also teaching undergraduate courses in crop management. Andrea has a BS in biology from Fordham University, a master's in applied climate science from Columbia University, and a PhD in agronomy and sustainable agriculture, agriculture from Iowa State University. And we're glad that she's here in Nebraska. Uh, look, go ahead with your presentation. Andrea. Yeah, thank you, Ken. It's nice of you to say, and I appreciate the invitation. I'm happy to be here tonight and in Nebraska in general. Um, yeah, I appreciate uh, the interfaith um, power and light highlighting the film and highlighting this issue. So, uh, you know, and as Ken just mentioned in my introduction, you know, I really do come at these issues related to regenerative agriculture, sustainable agriculture from a climate perspective. That's really what got me from New York. I'm originally from New Jersey. I did not grow up on a farm, but that is what moved me to Iowa uh, in 2011 to start my PhD. So lots of people thought I was kind of crazy to move to Iowa. And then when I got to Iowa, people thought I was you know, it was weird that I lived there. So and actually that does kind of fill into some of the things I want to track about the voices in the film and who we invite into these conversations and how we can make this conversation about, um, you know, healing the earth together. Um, I think the voices that we have at the table are really important in that. And so um, I will come back to that at the end, but Ken invited me to speak to what the university is doing on some of these topics. And so I want to share a few things. I don't have any slides. I'm going to just um, talk through a few things. And so I would say just in general at UNL, we are really trying in an integrated way to study, educate, communicate, do outreach, the pillars of the land grant institution around um, the management the economics of soil health management systems. And so I sometimes use soil health and regenerative agriculture kind of interchangeably. I think regenerative ag is certainly much broader than that. But I would say, you know, there is a lot going on and not necessarily a particular point person because we are trying to do this work in a really integrated way. So I, you know, appreciate everything Graham shared and his overview of some of the different principles and, you know, some of the things that we're working on. I'll just kind of go through some highlights and happy to use the chat or follow up with anybody who has questions. But, you know, we do have really robust efforts, I would say, around all of those principles related to soil health. Um, some of the ones that I'm more involved with are related to cover crops, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, including what my virtual background is here. Um, we have a pretty active group within our beef systems initiative that is working on grazing cover crops um, and the economics around those systems. And that's a really encouraging thing for me, you know, coming from Iowa, where there are not a lot of cattle. I see this as a real opportunity, as Graham said, that there's a lot of land and 
livestock that could be there. And a lot of young people and the students that I work with on a regular basis um, in my undergrad courses who are really interested in, in cover crops and that opportunity. So grazing, economics. Um, on that note too, I'm a part of a team um, that's gonna be leading a multi-institution new course about cover crops. We believe that that is the first in the nation to do this. And so I am very excited about it. We have over 30 students already enrolled in a brand new elective. So I think that speaks to the interest that um, students have around learning more about regenerative farming. I just talked about climate change today in class and I still feel um, there is a lot of hope when I talk to students that they're really excited and passionate about these issues and they know that it is important to their future and their um, opportunities in consulting and being back on the farm. And so um, I'm gonna come back to cover crops and soil health in a, in a minute and talk more specifically about one um, initiative that I'm a part of, but I would say, you know, in terms of the other aspects of soil health that we're doing a lot around at the university, I have a kind of growing program around Kernza, which is a perennial grain crop that's been developed by the Land Institute. I'm pretty excited about that. I'm a part of a new um, effort that's going to be, you know, across the U.S. and studying um, the commercialization and management and um, education around this kind of growing crop that is really low input and um, doesn't require a lot. It can be used in a dual use system with livestock too. And so I think that's a great um, opportunity and something that we are, are doing. Um, Long-term research on crop rotations, forage crops, um, that's ongoing at the university as well. Um, Agroforestry, we also have a long-term site that's been in place for over 40 years um, in Eastern Nebraska. So that's kind of a unique thing that we have here as well that you know, speaks to the diversity of things that we already have growing in the state, which I think is a strength in terms of um, seeing it expand. And um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention anything about some of the kind of grassland management and maintenance work that's been ongoing with the university in terms of um, you know, protecting the Sandhills environment, preventing encroachment of um, Eastern red cedar. I you know I do appreciate in the film that they mention um, the role that livestock has to play. And I think again, as a model and all the things that Graham mentioned that um, we can do that well here in Nebraska. And so I wanted to just mention too, this one particular project that I'm a part of that is a, a great partnership with the NRCS. A lot of this work that I'm referring to that we're doing in the soil health space is um, in, done in collaboration with the NRCS. And so we've got a great relationship with them. And so this project that the field behind me that I was visiting last week sampling is a part of uh, the Soil Health Initiative. And I'll put some information in the chat about that when I'm done speaking. Um, we're working with, um, well, the whole initiative has about 17 farmers across the state who are doing on-farm research, um, replicated strips of various soil health management systems that they got to design. And so we're doing research more intensively on about six to eight of those farms. And um, actually Del Fike is one of those farmers, but he, um, him and others are part of an analysis that one of my graduate students, Fernanda Krupak has just been doing. And um, what we find, you know, really does highlight some of the science in the film about um, how greater soil health, this is exactly what we see in Nebraska, but I, I appreciate that they, they do highlight this um, in the film that, you know, across different soils, um, different farms in Nebraska, we see that there's a greater release of nutrients from the organic pool of the soil that leads to um, essentially less requirement of um, chemically based or other inputs to uh, have fertility on those farms. And so this is really exciting that we're starting to see that across these sites. And it's again, um, and other work that I've done as Ken mentioned related to water cycling. I, I love that the film highlighted a lot of the benefits that um, these soil health related practices have for water. Um, I think that's a huge benefit. Um, we did some work where we found that continuous roots in the soil can improve water infiltration um, more so than things like um, tillage, reducing tillage. And um, that was really exciting, got a lot of attention. I think that people can really understand um, the value that having roots in the soil um, better aggregation, better structure can provide when you have these heavy rain events. I think that really resonated, but that all like tracks with, again, what I've found in my work, what we're seeing in Nebraska and what other people have found in different environments around better soil health and the improvement, not just in, um, you know, profitability from reducing inputs, but also, um, you know, in greater yields 
Um, so this is, you know, work that has been found kind of all over the U.S. at lots of different sites. And I, I you know, kind of want to um, build on that. And I really do appreciate what Graham said as well, that, um, you know, I think we have to respect the fact that farmers will be on a continuum and a transition around this journey. And, you know, I think that the film is probably not building a lot of bridges to more conventional farmers. And, um, you know, I know that every film is not going to reach every audience and Ken did not invite me here to fact check the film, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize, and I think the film missed an opportunity to be honest, to talk about um, really the change that has to occur. I mean, they did a little bit, right? I really appreciated that they talk about changing individual hearts and minds. And that really is what it's about. And so I really appreciate everyone being here tonight, even whether you're involved in farming or your family has farmed, or you're just really passionate about these types of issues. I, I think it is really about individual hearts and minds and growing the community of people who are really interested in these um, topics. And so, you know, I think the film makes it obvious that these are kind of systems that we want to see people moving to, but the shift is actually not trivial to make, right? And so um, I don't think that we got into this system overnight. I don't think we're going to get out of it overnight. Um, you know, farmers really need to see the value of it and be able to take a long-term view, which really policy and incentive structure does not make it easy um, to do right now. And so I would just like to kind of conclude with a few thoughts and a little bit of commentary on the film. I'm assuming that some of you have seen it or um, will still see it, but you know, I do, I really appreciated the ending point of the film. I thought it ended on such a positive, hopeful, aspirational note. I almost maybe shed a tear too with Jason Mraz as I won't give up at the end. I mean, I just think that was very beautiful and inspiring. Um, and um, I will say in spite of that, I was a little disappointed that the film didn't kind of include more diverse voices. And, you know, I think it is fairly a historic in not recognizing that regenerative agriculture did not start with some of the voices that were in this film. Um, I though Ray Archuleta has been an inspiration to me. Alan Savory is an amazing human. There's some like great stories that they tell, but that's not where regenerative agriculture started. We know that it started with indigenous communities. We know that um, people like George Washington Carver piloted what we know about resource use efficiency, crop rotations, with the population of farmers that he worked with at Tuskegee University um, during reconstruction, right? So we know that there are more voices that could be heard. And, you know, I appreciate that Ken did invite us to, you know, speak about our own faith or our guiding principles. And I would say for me, really guiding principle is around kind of equity and inclusion. And I really feel passionately that if we're not thinking about all of these other voices, then, and, and who are the other people who are involved and who could be empowered to be making decisions related to agriculture, one group I'll name that I have done some work with in Nebraska are women landowners, non-operator landowners who um, are really interested, I think, in improving their land, but have don't always see how they have the agency to be involved in some of those decisions. And so I think that's definitely a point of the film that they missed the mark on a bit and would have rather seen less of Tom Brady um, and more of some other um, voices like that. And so uh, I think that is really important and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and you know, to, on the voices front, you know, Graham's note of all those things at the end about economic opportunity. I think more divorce, diverse voices around the state can, can help us support that. So I would just say, you know, in terms of all of you being here, I appreciate that on a uh, evening, taking the time. Um, there's great people in this community right here who are involved in the policy discussions that are happening in the state. And I think one of the shortcomings of, you know, trying to advance soil conservation is that there isn't a big constituency who is supportive of it. And I think that agriculture being kind of rolled into the climate conversation offers an opportunity for that. And so just that you're here and you are aware of some of the, you know, policy ideas. Graham showed a great last slide of some of those ideas. Um, you know, you can help us grow the community of people who care. And so um, I think I'll leave it there. Appreciate the opportunity and happy to um, answer questions after or in the chat. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Andrea. And, and uh, everybody's got lots of great ideas. And, and I think we could have given each one of you a 45 minute opportunity to speak and you could have uh, would, would have had no shortage of ideas to share. So, so uh, well, I, I appreciate your, your presentation. I'd like to move now to, to Chuck Porter. Um, and, uh, and Chuck is, was 
raised in central in Indiana by devoted parents who were both school teachers. And while in college, Chuck found a strong love for service, being a part of numerous mission trips, which led to a firm belief that volunteers receive much more from their experiences than they give, provided they are invested in listening and understanding the life and experiences of those who are served. While on the Dayton area, Chuck began growing produce for, for direct sale to private to farmers market customers. Uh, and then uh, he and his wife, Susanna, were offered an opportunity to move to a farm in Southeast Nebraska to help the farm's owner develop a diversified farm plan for his 100, 160 acre farm. Now, 20 years later, they continue to reside in Oto County, Nebraska. Along with his small farming pursuits, Chuck is also a soil conservation technician for the Natural Resources Conservation Service of the USDA, a position he's held for over 10 years. Chuck has many heroes in the large fraternity of ecological agricultural apologists. Among them are Wes Jackson, Wendell Berry, David Vetter, and Ray Archuleta. Chuck, uh, share your words with us. Well, thank you, Ken. Very, very happy to be with you. Uh, one of those uh, inspiring gentlemen on my list uh, happens to be joining us tonight, too. So a big hello to Dave Vetter out there. Glad to see you. Uh, I bef Before I really get into what I was prepared uh, to say, I, I appreciate Andrea bringing up uh, the Land Institute. Uh, Land Institute really going light years beyond uh, a, a lot of the examples of regenerative ag uh, that you would even see in, in such a wonderful film as Kiss the Ground. And I did see there's a comment from you know, one of our attendees, Helen Greer, uh, asking about the Land Institute's approach. Love the fact that they were brought up because here's some dedicated people that have been involved in researching the possibility of having perennial polycultures in agriculture. Uh, sounds just like it says, perennials in the landscape, intentionally polycultural, um, but also intentionally productive uh, for food and fiber. Uh, anyone that's involved in the Land Institute would tell you that they're in their infancy in terms of really feeling like uh, they know how the end result is gonna pan out for perennial polycultures but as Wes Jackson, the founder of the Land Institute would say, and he, he said this many years ago, that it's not the problems of ag agriculture, but that the problem is agriculture and that we need to change it drastically uh, in order to, to stop repeating the same uh, problems that we create for ourselves. Um, I highlight that really quickly, just to say anyone that has not been uh, made aware of the Land Institute, Simple Google search uh, for the Land Institute, Salina, Kansas, and you'll have hours of reading to do to, to be very inspired. So um, anyway, appreciate being here tonight. Uh, I kind of laughed to myself when, when Ken uh, mentioned uh, my wife and family and I moving to Nebraska, uh, similar to Andrea being very far from our original home and when we said we were moving to Nebraska, many of our friends and family members treated it like we were saying we were moving to the Yukon, asking such things as, is it cold there? And things of that sort. So uh, even in the Midwest, uh, um, our locales can seem really exotic uh, to, to other people less than uh, 700 miles away. So anyhow, yesterday uh, I made an announcement at my church uh, here in, uh, in Syracuse, Nebraska, where I'm joining you from tonight, that I had been graciously invited by my friend Ken to get together virtually, of course, with many of his friends to talk about regenerative agriculture. I explained to our congregation, who are mostly people who have been involved in agriculture all of their lives, that it is understandable that yet another conceptual movement that strives to improve and clean up farming doesn't sound like something for them to be too enthused about. However, I let them know that the years they've been told that agriculture is the problem 
has given them very little reason to hope for a future in which agriculture is not vilified from all of the outsiders looking in. I told these fine people, my friends and my neighbors, that they really ought to watch Kiss the Ground and soak in the message that global agriculture, agriculture may finally be seen as not just one of the key efforts to reverse ecological degradation and to slow and hopefully reverse human influence climate change, that they could finally see it that way. Um, the true message I believe of the film, if you make it all the way through it and you don't allow yourself in the initial uh, segments of the film to just decide it's another lamb basting of modern conventional ag, the true message is that this wait and see approach on climate action is no longer an option. Globally, enough food is produced for 10 billion people. Productivity, which has long been our reckless goal, is not the problem that needs solving. This film asks us to imagine that the institutions of the wealthy world ought to shift their collective design intentions away from productivity and put themselves at the service of regenerating the vibrant natural world that we all know is still possible on a resilient planet. We are asked to imagine shifting from the design for productivity toward a design and a cooperation toward diversity. One of the members of our congregation sent me a text this afternoon that he thought a, a couple of the latest editions of the John Deere Corporation's magazine, The Furrow, had articles talking about the very same topic I was raising at church yesterday. And he was right that John Deere, among many other influential ag corporations, have been heralding the message of diversity and soil health and resilience. And we should all be thankful for that. But I noticed in what's kind of a memorable quotes section of the March 2021 issue of the furrow, uh, there was a quote from uh, President John F. Kennedy and it, it went like this. The great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, which is deliberate and contrived and dishonest, but instead the myth, which is persistent and persuasive and realistic. That quote reminded me, even yet this evening before signing in, that we absolutely need to break bread with everyone who has a stake in agriculture in order to have the tough conversations that are needed. But those conversations require a disciplined mind that accepts that someone else's hard held truths may not be easily swayed. And yet another's outright lies could lead us down a path of necessary discovery. So I should say, with all that being said, I am not at all a fan of conventional agriculture. There are too many myths and data-free assumptions that prop up modern agriculture. Too many ecological expenses are left off the balance sheet. Too much unfettered productivity gets celebrated while health, wellness, and resilience are forced to the periphery. But this movie, Kiss the Ground, keeps saying over and over that it doesn't have to be this way. We can be adequately productive while also being good stewards. We can nurture life and learn to accept natural processes and consequences on their own terms. Now my work with the Natural Resources Conservation Service which is an agency within what is a very monstrous United States Department of Agriculture. That position uh, being a 
soil conservation technician allows me to work closely with my neighbors to assess what problems we are creating with farming operations and how we can do better. Now, Ray Archuleta is highlighted quite a lot in the film. And if you didn't know before, uh, Ray has long been a champion for soil health and he ought to be given much of the credit for pushing NRCS toward a big role in encouraging as well as incentivizing soil health practices. As you'll see in the film or have already seen if you've watched it, Ray was instrumental in moving Gabe Brown forward to be one of the most respected regenerative farmers in the United States and for that matter around the globe. Their story together is a victory for NRCS as an agency but also for US agriculture. We are all very fortunate that NRCS is structured nationwide to be very local in scope. For the most part, NRCS is in every county in the nation. In the state of Nebraska, there is a USDA service center in most individual counties. And that office building typically contains a one-stop shop of the Farm Service Agency, a farm loan office, and NRCS. Now in our state, there is a long-standing relationship between NRCS as a federal agency and the statewide organization of natural resource districts. That partnership has existed formally since the early 1970s but it harkens back much further to some very dedicated individuals who saw the need to formalize a way in which better conservation practices could be taught to rural Americans. Subs subsequently protecting the gifts of soil, water, of forests, and other natural resources that we all depend upon. The predecessor of NRCS, which was the Soil Conservation Service was founded in 1935 by the US government under the direction of Hugh Hammond Bennett, who happened to turn 140 years old toward the end of last week. I mentioned Lou Hugh, Hugh Hammond Bennett because I'd like you to look him up and uh, see just, just where we got started as an agency uh, you'll be very impressed with the drive of Mr. Bennett, especially after a lot of bleak experiences as a country through the Dust Bowl years. Now, in terms of NRCS resources, I could, you know, talk for hours on opportunities for people and ways you can plug in to NRCS as an agency for assistance, for consultation, uh, for incentive monies, for doing conservation work. Um, but I'll instead let you discover those things really on your own. That's really the best way to proceed. One key way to proceed is to reach out to your own NRCS office in your locale. Uh, that would be at the USDA Service Center in the county uh, where you reside or in the circumstances where there's a two county office. Uh, it will be fairly easy to uh, determine where the NRCS office is um, and talk to the resource conservationist of that office and let them know, you know what your concerns are, uh, how you might uh, uh, want some help uh, on your own farm or in your own backyard for that matter, uh, dealing with what resource concerns you might have. Uh, more directly, and I don't know how well you'll see this, I would say go online, do a search for the Farmer's Guide to Farm Bill Programs. Farmer's Guide to Farm Bill Programs. Simple as a Google search again to bring up a really well done uh, two page uh, synopsis, if you will, of all of the Farm Bill Programs available uh, to uh, people around uh, the country. That includes a number of the NRCS programs I will highlight really quickly, uh, you know, 
many of you've probably heard of our main workhorse program that incentivizes conservation work uh, throughout the country. That is our environmental quality incentives program. Um, government loves acronyms. Uh, so we call that the EQIP program. Uh, EQIP, uh, we pronounce it EQIP, uh, millions of dollars spent annually in the pursuit of better stewardship of natural resources uh, in the United States. Uh, so again, please look, look that up if you want a good uh, at your fingertips resource for what's available. Uh, I'll mention quickly, uh, I did uh, mention EQIP. We also have our conservation stewardship program uh, that incentivizes uh, landowners and operators to take that extra step. You know, they've already been recognized as good stewards on their farms and uh, you know, want, to, want some more assistance to help them go the extra step to, to uh, unfold new conservation plans for their farm. Uh, and I'll also mention uh, in recent years, the uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program has been funded that allows us more readily to work with partner organizations uh, towards uh, larger scale efforts um, cooperative efforts on a regional basis uh, toward conservation goals. So anyhow, you've heard me babble uh, for long enough. Uh, please let me close by quoting Lynn Davis, who I have found uh, uh, through the resilience.org uh, daily emails uh, that I receive. Um, she is the CEO of the Open Food Network in the United Kingdom. And she posted, posted an article, I believe this was today uh, where I read it, uh, on resilience.org. The quote goes like this, and this is how I'll close. It takes courage and boldness to believe that humanity is stronger by collaborating, to let go of the need to predict and control outcomes. And it takes self-compassion when falling back into old patterns and patience to see things we don't understand. It is, it is in no way easy, but these controlling systems that manifest in the outer world are mirrored in the inner world of so many of us raised in an industrial mentality. There is a lot to nurture if we are to ensure that the vibrant diverse world we imagine doesn't fall further into the confines of our imaginary realms. So, Thanks again, Ken, for the invitation. I'm having a really good time and uh, loving to, to hear everybody else uh, in their comments. Well, thank, thank you, Chuck, and, and appreciate all the comments that everyone's making. And, and I'm learning lots of things from, from everyone. Well, I'd like to finish tonight with Ruth, Ruth Chantry from Common Good Farms. Ruth is the co-owner farmer at Common Good Farm near Raymond, Nebraska. The farm is a small diversified farm and certified organic and certified biodynamic. A long list of diversity has come through the farm and the focus remains on organic produce, organic vegetable and herb seedlings and plants, organic pastured laying hens, pastured pork and grass fed beef. For nearly 25 years, Ruth and her husband have offered a CSA, Nebraska's oldest and longest running CSA to which they felt the farm stewardship and community versus commodification was and is the goal for the community and the farm. She, she co-founded Buy Fresh by Local Nebraska and was a founding member of Slow Food Nebraska. She served on several nonprofit boards, mostly focused on local food and farming. She currently serves as the board president of the Nebraska Sustainable Agriculture Society and looking forward to Ruth's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can't see my eyes, but then if I put my glasses up, I can't see you. So <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak mostly to um, just what we're doing here at our place. Um, I have the benefit of the my husband being the soil master and I get the um, to enjoy the fruition um, that I've seen change on our place over the last 20, almost 20, well, 20 years on this place. Um, 
So uh, yeah, we, um, one thing I will point out that um, the sustainable seems to have evolved into the word regenerative, not necessarily, but one thing that's always appealed to me so much about it is that it's not prescriptive. It's um, endlessly creative in how each farm can approach um, their space and what they can do there um, based on who they are, what their soil is, um, the size, their background, their family around them and their support. Um, so I just think it's an endlessly creative opportunity. Um, we have just 20 acres at our home place. We've had um, some pasture that we graze, but we don't have any currently um, in addition. Um, and uh, as Ken said, we're focused mostly now on plants, um, some pork, beef, um, and then the eggs is a large part and some produce. So we're always kind of continually responding to the changes in our family, um, the land that's available, market demands or um, non-demands as it were. Um, so we're certified organic. We're also certified biodynamic. Um, if no one's familiar with that, or if you are very briefly, that uh, meets and exceeds organic standards. Um, and that deals also tremendously looking at soil health and um, the idea that the farm is a whole organism. So all our, I shouldn't say all, but a great deal of our problem solving, um, we try and look within the farm to solve problems or create fertility for the farm within the farm. So that's one reason we've always had so much diversity. Um, and trying to mitigate problems. For example, within the farm, um, we have pork because we needed to get pigs because we had a terrible bindweed problem. And so I think speaking to Becky's question, so we tried to look at um, over time, what can we do? Um, for example, I know I'm jumping around a bit, but uh, carrots germinate, um, say it takes 10 days for carrots to germinate. And we had quite a large bindweed problem that was getting ever worse. And so we couldn't just quit farming, you know, for three years and put hogs on the whole place, but we could intensively graze hogs or on, you know, certain fallow sections of the fields. And so, um, and that really, after a year, we could even see how, um, how much difference they made in where they were. Um, Cause I was about ready to throw in the towel on the bindweed situation. So, um, so it, we really look at problem solving within the farm. Um, it also speaks to, we think, um, keeping quality of the vegetables and then the health of the plants that we grow for sale, but also um, biodynamics is general, often associated with um, wineries just because uh, the keep the, I should say the great quality. So it comes through in the quality of the food. Um, we do a lot of, on, well, all our compost is made on farm. So that's for our potting mix for the greenhouse. Um, that's why the cattle are here. So we originally, I mean, of course we want the beef, but the cattle originally came so we could control the on-farm composting. Um, and that's all used for spreading on our pastures, on our fallow veg fields um, pre-season and then making our own potting mix. Um, and then we do also have some agreements with some farms or some land around the area where we it's certified under us for our hay or some of our hay needs. And then we spread because um, we have too much um, compost or chicken litter, et cetera, for our own place. Um, so we spread some of those, you know, farther afield. Um, so uh, yeah, I I don't have some big evolved speech or anything. But I think that the most important thing that we've always tried to accomplish here is the diversity. Um, the soil when we, it had been CRP, so Conservation Reserve Program land for probably 10 years before we got it. Um, so nothing had been done to it, but also nothing had been done to it. Um, so we could get certified right away, but it was also, there was an earthworm activity, there weren't songbirds around, and that's an incredible change that we've seen over the time that we've been on this land. Um, we've had um, someone that's better at birding than I, he's a postdoc in biology and orn ornithology, um, 45 different species at least of songbirds here, um, and which I think is pretty remarkable in such a small space. Um, I think that speaks to the diversity in such a small area. We are not just creating um, cropping areas, even for vegetables, but we create, we're trying to create different kinds of wildlife habitat. Um, there's a lot of different kind of pockets of different um, 
areas, like in some, you know, fallow, uh, weedy areas, they don't look attractive to me, but there's a lot of activity there. There's, um, you know, the wind breaks and the, even the fence rows. Um, so there's a lot of different diversity and we've tried to increase the, increase the diversity that's here and available. Um, we have chickens because they eat grasshoppers. And so whenever we think everything's too much, we think, well, I don't wanna do vegetables without chickens and I don't wanna do chickens without vegetables just because how they end up going together. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. We also, um, as I said, we try and minimize what we bring on the farm. Um, that said, because of our size, we do bring in obviously vegetable seeds and hay for our cattle. And then we um, are fortunate actually in Nebraska that we can buy so many um, uh, Nebraska grown certified organic grains. So um, buy as much at like Grain Place or some other direct purchases, um, which not everyone realizes how many organic crops are grown, small grains or other that are grown in Nebraska. And um, I think that's to be valued. A lot of places say in Minnesota, if they were doing organic laying hens, they would have to ship in um, those grains from much farther away. I think, uh, and then again, our soil and the importance of our soil is um, mitigating things like drought. Uh, we've gone through several pretty intense drought spells here. Um, we don't seem to catch even last year. We had hardly any rain, even though we're 15 miles northwest of downtown Lincoln. There's a lot of great little two inch rains, or I shouldn't say little, but fabulous two inch rains that Lincoln got that we entirely missed. So in working with our soil, um, as Graham had mentioned that we're trying to address uh, the water, you know, the water holding capacity of our soil is really quite good. Um, in a wet year, that isn't always fabulous because it can take longer to dry out. But in a dry year, which I tend to think that we're going to have more of those than not, um, that that's been really helpful um, overall. So lots of earthworm activity has changed over the years. Um, just lots of diversity that that is encouraging to see how it affects things. Um, the flip side of it is I've also seen how things are have changed so much. I don't know that it's a failure on our part, some of the pests that have increased tremendously. I see it as a change in the, the, the change in the climate that's already happened in the last, I'd say 10 years. Um, so there's a lot of pest problems that were not a problem 10 or 15 years ago. I think because of the, um, their cycles have altered already. Um, so there's problems that, um, things that used to lay eggs once a season, now we're seeing that they're here all year. And um, I think those, so when you're watching something like Kiss at the Ground, I think it's always good to keep in mind that it's, it is not some distant thing, it's already happening. There's already changes happening here. Um, and they have been for some time. Um, I'm surprised always when some of my longtime customers still think it's some distant far off thing when I've been communicating with them for years um, that this is something that we're facing every day right now and how difficult actually it's become. I think it's harder to grow vegetables here now than it was even 10 years ago. Um, and so I think that's something to keep in mind as we actually in our area of Nebraska, I think we're very capable and have a really favorable climate for growing a huge diversity and feeding ourselves within the state or nearby states. Um, the capacity to grow things here is huge. And um, the manpower, but also the land that's available. Um, yeah, so all sorts of factors are favorable to that, um, but it's getting ever more difficult, I think. And I think it would be hard to start off actually farming right now um, because you wouldn't necessarily know what's a baseline for normal, I guess, um, because it's always changing and the swings seem more extreme, which is to me what climate change really is about. Um, I think Kiss the Ground, if you haven't watched it, I think it does a, a really good job of explaining things like carbon sequestration in a very straightforward way. Um, so it doesn't seem quite so abstract and talking about things like um, root development and things um, that are just really helpful to understand. I've recommended it highly to several high school um, teachers for their classes to watch and families, because uh, I just think it's really approachable and positive overall.
So um, I know I jumped around a little bit there, but, uh, but, and I would also say that um, my husband and I both separately, before we started farming, we both decided we wanted to be for something versus against something in our efforts to make the world a better place. And I think both are probably needed, um, but that's just our personalities. And so in doing what we do, um, we felt like we were for something and could, you know, extend ourselves to our communities in this way. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's a blessing to be able to do that. And it, I think it takes a lot of faith to keep doing it. <laughs> so, um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think we're all fortunate in this area to be able to have such um, strong strong small farm networks as well as row crops and grains that um, there's a lot of good networking in Nebraska um, and a lot of good information and resources that can be shared. So so thank you, Ken and all. Well, thank you. Um, well, I know there's been a lot of questions that have been posted in the chat and there's been quite a bit of, there's been a number of answers that have already been provided. Um, well, um, um, I guess I'd like to follow up with a question, and I guess I'd like to begin with Ruth and 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 go on to and hear other people's responses. But one of the big questions that I think that I've heard and that that uh, I think were implied in in some of the questions in the chat is, uh, can farmers make a living by doing regenerative agriculture? And and so I guess I'd start with you, Ruth. I, uh, is this, I mean, I, I'm not saying, expecting anybody to say, oh yeah, it's gonna be a, a breeze, but mm -hmm. is it something, um, what's your experience and how, how would you um, Well, I mean, I guess unusually, neither of us grew up farming. Um, so partly that's probably why we did what we did. For example, we didn't wanna take on a huge amount of debt with large equipment. We didn't have a land base um, in the family or anything like that. Um, I do think it's possible. I do think it requires some sacrifice. I think we were also fortunate to get some, you know, only 20 acres, but some land before the prices got even more astronomical. Um, I don't, I think I've known people that have bought some land, you know, within the last five years. And I think I know, but I also know of several young couples that just can't swing it. Um, so not to get completely political, but I think there's even, maybe they can do it but there's um, health insurance is the driving factor. They can't they can't quite swing it with some of those external pressures for you know making the economy work. Like maybe they're really they're I've seen some of them. They're fantastic at growing, um, and they're or presentation or networking or marketing. But um, there's some external pressures like land prices or health insurance that make it really additionally difficult. And I do think, like I said, I think it's, there's so many opportunities with grazing all sorts of, you know, animals and the markets available. Um, there's so much information available now with the internet and resources. Um, yeah, I think the support's there. And I think the, you know, I think the opportunities are there, but I, I don't think it's easy by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 uh... Does anyone else want to respond to that question? Yeah, Ken, I would like to. Um, it's challenging. The risk is great, especially on the front end, going through those things. Um, it does take a lot of time and a lot of research. Uh, so, um, you know, I've questioned some of these things as we've been going through it too, but I'm, I am feeling more confident with some of the other examples. There's more increased examples out there. But if I, I think about it like this, for um, expense reductions, we cut out neonicotinoids, that saved us money. We, and that's the seed coating, that's the controversial deal at Alt Energy. So that actually costs extra. We went to a cheaper seed that was a non-GMO seed versus the typical conventional seed um, that you, know, you would call conventional as, as conventional ag. Um, so we were able to save money on seed. Um, we've started to use just a little bit less chemicals and eliminated some of the big bad ones. So a little bit of cost savings there. And we expect that to just increase a little bit more as we get more biodiverse. Um, we've, we're gradually phasing back um, our, our nutrients that we're putting down. 
especially as we implement the more biodiversity and the cows. Um, so we're learning about that now, but we have once again, good peer mentorship that's helped us understand how to do this in a way that it works. And those cows are gonna be a big part of our fertilizer plan. So they become part of that input cost, but then we sell the cows. So we actually make quite a bit of money off of doing that. We have to, don't have cows yet, but this is, this is how we're gonna you know, recoup these costs. Um, we, our farm is solarized and that's gonna save us approximately over 25 years, $225,000 of electricity bills. And we're tapping into markets that just give us about 40 to 50 per cents per bushel. Um, with the cows, we're going to bring on somebody and use, you know, a lot of the money um, to make sure that that young person is, is, is you know, paid well. Um, and But that fertilizer benefit is the main benefit for us there. And so as long as he's good and we're spending less money on fertilizer, um, I think we can help with the, the direct marketing that we'll be doing. But um, that's all we need to be able to benefit this with trees. Um, I just don't want to go backwards because those erosion gains, that carbon sequestration and pumping nutrients into our soil, um, you know, those are the big things that we really want there, but it's going to create another crop and that's going to be another opportunity, opportunity to pay one more person, you know, out here as a part of our farm um, and potentially a couple part times on the side. And then, um, you know, and then if we wanted to get into a whole nother level with, with a, a greenhouse situation, which we were considering, that would be another job. And we just can't go negative. We just have to pay someone well there and pay the taxes. So all of these things increase our profitability opportunities and reduce the cost that we're putting into the system. You can see how this is challenging and it must be thought through, but um, at the same time, I see a lot of opportunity. I just think the front end is, is risky and that these farmers that are doing this need a lot of peer mentorship and also financial support um, in many cases to be able to get them into a position where they're starting to seek those benefits. And I think you know there should be more emphasis on policy areas to minimize the farmer's risk in order to help get them in the door so um, a bunch of these things can start occurring. Thanks, Graham. And I noticed that, that Andrea made a uh, had a response about the um, about actions that people can take re regarding the the farm bill. Uh, do you want to say something more about that, Andrea? Sure. And Susan asked a great question. Um, you know, I, I did actually work in Washington D.C. for two years before I moved to Nebraska, and I interacted with a lot of professionals from the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. I think they're really a gold star of advocacy around these issues that we're talking about. There's a lot of other groups involved, but when she sent that, I just quickly looked to see if they have any kind of dear congressperson letter. So I would I would encourage folks to stay in the loop of what they're doing for these kinds of issues and for guidance. But I also think, you know, someone like Graham is a great resource um, as well within the state if you're thinking about local issues as well. I would just add to the question you asked, it is possible for people to make a living. It is difficult for all the reasons that Ruth and Graham said, but I think it does offer an opportunity. Ruth is a perfect example of someone who's not from a farm and may, is making a, uh, has a great you know career built around her you know very diverse farm. So I think it's an opportunity for people who are trying to do something different, who want to, you know, make a living on not a huge amount of land and take on all the debt. I think her story is just epitomizes it, but so kudos to those great answers that they gave too. Yeah, well, and also I think there may be some opportunities, hopefully the Biden administration, there, there's some discussion about providing incentives for, for, um, for more regenerative activities. And, and, and I think that will, that will motivate a lot of people. I mean, uh, there, are, there are some people who will do it because it's the right thing, and and but I think in addition, people need to know that that they're they need to feed their, themselves, they need to feed their families, and so if there's some financial opportunities there, that that can help. Um, well, uh, Chuck, do you want do you just unmute? Yeah, Ken, I, I would regret not speaking up to also say. Uh, reach out to your local extension offices, reach out to your local USDA service centers, for sure reach out to us at NRCS. Um, 
don't accept the answer that there's not help for you uh, getting started with regenerative ag. There's plenty of help for you. There's plenty of focus on the university level towards regenerative ag. Um, you know, for years, it's maybe been the ugly stepchild, but it's, that's no longer the case. You know, little by little, there's inroads into sustainable regenerative ag efforts on a large scale through university efforts. Uh, also, uh, NRCS, we've got incentive dollars available to people wanting to transition into agriculture uh, of, a, of a different sort. Uh, there's or, organic ag transition dollars that don't get claimed by a, a large portion of the United States every year. Uh, there's dollars, really good incentive monies toward uh, putting up hoop houses to extend uh, growing seasons on, on uh, operations. Um, and there's a multitude of other ways to plug in to uh, dollars that are available to offset costs uh, to get started. Uh, but even just as important in, into expertise uh, to help you get started uh, from agronomic, you know, principles and, and uh, planning uh, methodologies, you know, that a lot of times people like me, you know, when I was growing for market, uh, I was very passionate about it and I was very much a dreamer and this is what I wanted to do with my life, but I wasn't a planner by any stretch of the imagination. And you really need someone to sit you down and help you plan you through the process. It makes a lot of difference. Well, that sounds good. Well, I guess um, a couple of things that I'd like to suggest is that that um, if our presenters can can send us their contact information and like uh, Ruth, if you can send us information about the Common Good Farms and and how people can get in touch with you um, and and Andrea and, and Chuck, if, uh, if you can send us some information, that would, that would be great. Yeah, all, all these things, yeah, I see Andrea just put her, her contact info in the, in the chat. But if you also want to send it to us, we can, we can also make it available to anybody who would like it. Um, um, well, we're kind of at a point where I'd like to wrap things up. I, I don't want to, I mean, does uh, anyone have some last, words they want to share with with us tonight. I really appreciate everyone being with us and I appreciate all the wonderful things that that everyone has shared tonight. Um, are there some some last words that I, I'd like to give every, each person a chance to, to make a, you know, a, a short final statement if you'd like. I could pathetically sing our table blessing from our home that is soil around soil things. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, bear with my voice here. <laughs> this is, yeah, we've sang this for a long time. Blessings on the blossom, blessings on the fruit, blessings on the leaf and stem, blessings on the root. <laughs> well, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I, I appreciate that, and, and I think I, I don't think we can top that. So, so <laughs> thank you, Ruth. And thank yeah. you, uh, Graham and Chuck and Andrea. And, and thank you for to everyone who participated tonight. Thank you for all the great questions and for all the great responses. And, and uh, have a great, uh, great week and, 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 and uh, tune in to, and, and do check out uh, Kiss the Ground. I think you'll enjoy it. So good night, everyone. Thanks, Ken. Good night. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Okay.